Hello, and welcome to the Unsung Cyber Heroes TV Network. I'm your host, Gary Berman. Our mission is to shine the light on the people and organizations who keep us safe online, while at work, home, and school, and to serve as a networking platform for the cybersecurity and information technology community. We've learned that 62% of human communications is nonverbal. That's why we include a video feed, so that you have the option of seeing our guests or simply to just listen. That's also why we're calling ourselves a TV network, business to business networking and video rather than just a podcast. Our strategic plan is to be a force multiplier by introducing people and organizations to one another. A rising tide does lift all ships. Today, we've invited an amazing group of thought leaders to discuss cybersecurity in the federal government. On this show, we'll cover the current state of cybersecurity within the federal government, the sectors of government which may be the most vulnerable to cyber attacks. We'll talk about the Cybersecurity Maturity Model, CMMC initiative from the Department of Defense and if small businesses can meet those standards and the communication strategies needed to articulate a winning cybersecurity strategy. All this and more on today's episode. I'd like to start by welcoming and introducing our amazing group of guests today for the Unsung Cyber Heroes event. First, we have Christina Tanishik, CEO of the Government Technology Services Coalition and find, founder of Homeland Security Today. General Greg Tuhill was the first CISO of the federal government and is currently the president of AppGate Federal Group. Dave Gardy is chairman and CEO of TV Worldwide and creator of CybersecurityTV.net. And Oliver, Oliver Tafakoli is the CEO of Vectra Networks, CTO rather, and he's gonna talk to us about artificial intelligence and machine learning. Really cool stuff. Hi, Christina. Good morning. Please share your origin story and, and your experience in, in working with the federal government, which has been uh, considerable in its variety and, and also its duration. What's it like to work with the federal government? Oh, it's the most fun thing I've ever done. <laughs> um, I've been working with the federal government for about 30 years. I actually moved to Washington, D.C. Uh, because I wanted to be a U.S. Senator. So that was my origin story. But when I got here, I learned there were so many more interesting things to do and really to plug the private sector in to the federal government became my personal mission, particularly around homeland security and cyber. So for the last, I guess, 20 years, I've been working on homeland security uh, and cyber security as it relates to federal government agencies and the mission of those agencies. Wow, I mean, that's uh, quite a, uh, an umbrella, you know, quite a portfolio. So we'll dive into that um, in, uh, in just a little bit. Uh, hi, General Tuhill. Hello, Gary. How are you? Good. Thanks so much for being with us today, and, and thank you for your service. Um, would you be kind enough to share, you know, with us and our audience about your journey to becoming the first CISO of the federal government? You bet. Uh, you know, for 40 years, my mission has been to preserve and protect national security and national prosperity. And I sincerely believe that you can't have one without the other. Uh, and uh, throughout my military career, I was involved as a communications and then later a cyber uh, officer in defending America's uh, military, its um, uh, defense industrial base, and in working uh, with our partners uh, across the world uh, to try to do a, you know, put together a, a coalition of good. And um, as I transitioned into the uh, federal civilian government, and I was recruited by Admiral Mike McConnell to continue my service. You know, one of the things that I learned was we need to share information in order to better protect national security and national prosperity. And uh, as the director of the National Cybersecurity and Communications Integration Center, also known by its acronym NCIC, um, and I did not come up with that acronym, I hate acronyms, um, I, I coined a phrase though, we've got to become a cyber neighborhood watch. We need to be sharing uh, what is going on in our neighborhood and learn from each other so that we can better protect America's information and the world's information. Wow, cyber neighborhood watch. I mean, you know, that's a, it's a, a, a giant idea that has lots of very local implications. So, you know, uh, thanks for that vision. Uh, hey, Dave. Hey, Gary. 
So you've had a long history of working with the federal government regarding communications and three letter agencies and all kinds of different folks. And how did you get started in, in uh, you know, how did you end up here? Well, my origin story is I, I graduated from the U.S. Merchant Marine Academy back in 1980. And I came down here as my first job was helping Reagan build a 600 ship Navy. And mostly it was converting broke old merchant ships into ammunition resupply ships for the Navy, and I was a Naval Reserve officer too. Uh, the Navy was taking Polaroid to as is condition surveys, and I brought out a video camera and started shooting the different spaces because I was the design engineer doing the specs for it. And then they really liked that because it was much more efficient because they could just look at the video and see what the condition of the ship was. Then I started using it for claims and shipyards and things like that, and I, I started getting into na making Navy videos, basically, and I, I quit my job as a Marine engineer and started a career basically supporting federal government uh, in, in television video production and that type of thing, mainly for technical things initially, but after buying and selling a few companies uh, that I built, uh, this one was uh, started in 1999. Uh, it's an internet TV network of channels. We have a cybersecurity network. We also have a maritime network, and uh, we support federal government webcasts from the National Science Foundation to the Department of Transportation to the Small Business Administration. We have uh, about 38 federal agency uh, clients, and that's how I got into it. Wow. Well, also, you know, thank you for your service. I mean, that, that's an incredibly interesting um, uh, journey. So thank you very much. So, uh, Christina, let me let me begin with you. You know, the, the topic of homeland security encompasses, uh, you know, so much. Um, where do you start in, in, in trying to unpack the cybersecurity requirements of the federal government? That's a huge question. And I think uh, what, we've, what we've seen is the federal government is even still trying to unpack all of that. Uh, before we started this webinar, um, Oliver was talking about how they operate from an assumption that the attack will happen, but it's finding the folks you know, to left of boom, as, as he said. And I think that's the key for businesses and others, because right now, if you are targeted for a cyber attack, the chances of you stopping it are pretty darn slim, regardless of your size. We've seen the Lockheeds, the Northrop Grumman's, the biggest companies in, in the nation uh, suffer cyber attacks. So I think that uh, I, I really agree with what Oliver said about how we need to realize that our, our starting point is that the attack will happen and it's mitigating those consequences that should be the focus. Well, and Oliver, I mean, when you and I were talking, you had an incredibly interesting uh, concept that you referred to as, as flipping the game. You know, how, how does the federal government uh, benefit from, from that concept of, uh, you know, that, that, um, that uh, we shared? Sure. Uh, I mean, the way the way I've thought about it, and, and this is this is really, uh, you know, something something an epiphany I would say that that probably struck about seven, eight, nine years ago for me, is that you know we we spent so much of our time up to that point um, trying to find the attackers uh, in the wild, right? And and the problem here fundamentally is you're hunkered down in your bunker, and you're just seeing the world in this in the chaotic mess of the world is come come in touch with your boundary. Right. This was all about prevention and, and the edge of the network. And in general, it's hard to make head or tail out of, uh, to do that well, to make head or tail out of who's, who's a friend and who's a foe in those kind of chaotic environments. The, flipping the game basically consists of saying, well, once they are inside, once the game is being played on my turf, right, however scary that may seem, I have built-in advantages. I know my environment. I know what is supposed to be happening in my environment. And they are now effectively in enemy territory. They're behind the lines. Uh, so that's really what flipping the game is about, is to, is to know your environment and to use tooling to model your environment. And you know, the, the world uh, in the commercial space as well as kind of in the federal space, it's gone really from pure prevention through some combination of prevention and detection and response. And detection and response is really the muscle that we have to kind of collectively build, but we play that game on our turf, not on the enemy's turf. Well, that really ties in with um, a fairly recent uh, policy change for the federal government, um, which is um, kind of being forward in our, in our cybersecurity you know, actions. You know, what are your thoughts about 
um, about that policy that, you know, we can have, you know, some offensive operations, you know, against, let's say, nation states or other bad actors. Yeah, I mean, I think that's that, that's an interesting. I mean, that's a big public policy question, right? What's fair? I, I'm in, sorry, I'm I'm asking these yeah. giant questions here. I'm, yeah, no, no, I'm, no, no. That, 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 that's a, that's a huge question because we can kind of all view that from the perspective of our particular country, and we can put ourselves into the shoes of people in other countries and say, well, if if they were attacking us at the behest of their government, how would we feel about it? So I think there's a, there's a double-edged sword here. Um, don't go pick a fight. Um, that you can't win. Um, I do think you need to be uh, preemptive at times, but you need to do that in a judicious way. And what you really just need to be able to do well is to have attackers effectively spend their energy um, getting caught in whatever defensive nets and that, that you have set and effectively punch themselves out. That I think is still the key, but I do think um, some amount of offensive and, and preemptive pieces have to always be part of the equation. So, in general, I mean, what do you think about that? You know, you, you know, your body of experience was was in the typical, you know, theaters of war, and now we have this kind of uh, fifth domain, you know, uh, in, in cybersecurity. I mean, are are we at war in cyberspace? Well, we've we've been in uh, periods of conflict for as long as cyberspace has actually been coined as uh, cyberspace. And, and the policy that you just referenced uh, with Oliver, you know, while, while that's a very public pronouncement, we've always had the capabilities as uh, the United States government and we've exercised them. We call that interdiction. And uh, interdiction is neutralizing an enemy or shaping their capabilities before they're able to achieve their goals. And in, uh, in airplane terms, you know, an interdiction, for example, would, uh, w a great example that we've seen in combat was in World War II, as well as in Desert Storm and the like, where we sent uh, fighter planes into enemy territory to take out their resupply lines and just basically starve the troops uh, on the front lines from ammunition, beans, you know, all, all of that type of stuff. Uh, in cyber terms, when we see something that is a threat, then we make a value-based decision as to whether or not we want to use uh, all means of national power to neutralize that threat. And it may be a cyber interdiction. It may be uh, a physical interdiction. You know, I can send in, you know, special forces to go take out that individual or I can use uh, legal constructs to have uh, that person in a, uh, or organization arrested. There's lots of tools out there, and I think we're seeing governments around the world now, though, uh, clearly stating what their intent is and then exercising it through policy and action. Wow, that's an incredibly um, important and interesting answer. So, Christina, you know, from a homeland uh, security uh, perspective, um, you know, one of the things that that we've done in our work in, in creating the Cyber Hero Adventures, uh, Defenders of the Digital Universe, is we're aligning with the DHS 16 critical infrastructure designations. They've recently gone through some uh, iterations, but, you know, uh, telecommunications, you know, financial services, uh, and right now, uh, the most uh, important sector is is healthcare. Well, what is your perspective, you know, on how the federal government is uh, dealing with or, you know, could deal with the notion of of uh, healthcare systems that are vulnerable, you know, to uh, ransomware and, you know, other forms of, uh, of attack? Well, I think they're doing many different initiatives to educate people on all different levels. Uh, they have focused most recently on the healthcare system because of the ability to hack devices and all kinds of ways that uh, bad actors can get into the healthcare system. Um, the FBI has started a very uh, internal uh, healthcare system only information exchange where they do real time information exchange among healthcare systems. Uh, in addition to a lot of the work that CISA does under their critical infrastructure sectors. And then, of course, 
the entire campaign around cybersecurity awareness, all of that is coalescing around different priorities each year. So we also mirror what DHS uh, selects as their kind of topic of the day, but they actually have months every year where they focus. Uh, you very familiar with Cybersecurity Awareness Month, but I think it's that real, type, real time sharing uh, General Tuhill mentioned, and that they have organizations that are focused on getting the actual people on the ground to be able to tell others what they're seeing in their systems in a confidential place. And um, and Dave, you know, you, you said something interesting that really caught my attention about your experience in the maritime ecosystem. I've learned um, that in the past uh, 18 months or so, that uh, President Putin, uh, while on um, his, uh, his ship, um, uh, had uh, an escort of a, a bunch of uh, you know ships to uh, protect him, and that um, through some manipulation of the global positioning system, um, all the ships uh, in the area were put off course. Is that true? And and if so, like what does it mean for uh, global positioning systems and cybersecurity? Well, you raise you raise a good issue, Gary. Uh, it's probably the most vulnerable part of uh, this particular industry, the maritime industry. Every industry goes through some cybersecurity awareness, and maritime is just starting. And it's uh, the concern is is basically the GPS spoofing you talked about of a ship's navigational system that would allow somebody to take control of it, run it into a bridge or another ship. And it's it's almost not a matter of of, of if it's going to happen. It's all a matter of when. And the maritime administrator, Admiral Buzz Busby extremely concerned about it. And we've been working with him to create something called this Cyber Skilled Mariner Program, which we do on our Maritime TV channel and our Cybersecurity TV channel. And that's to train people to be aware of some of the cybersecurity awareness aboard ship, you know, moving thumb drives around from different processors in the, in the ship's navigation system or uh, the, the, any ship systems and, and making the network vulnerable. And on um, May 19th, we're doing it a whole program that's all virtual we're actually gonna demonstrate that from a ship simulator in Norfolk. Uh, they're gonna show how they can do this so people are aware of what to look for. Uh, and it's a, it's a big vulnerability right now in the maritime space. And 90% of what we have in the United States comes via, via the maritime industry. And, and how would our audience uh, be able to tap into that webcast? Do you have a URL or something you can share now? Yeah, it's, it's, on, it's on maritimetv.com. Uh, and also cybersecuritytv.net, and it's the 19th. It's probably going to start around 2 o'clock Eastern. Wow, that's an incredibly uh, interesting uh, subject matter. Um, you know, after a, a speech that I gave at a, a security conference, I had the privilege of meeting someone from the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, um, you know, and to, and to discuss the viability of, of GPS spoofing and, and, uh, and hacks, and, you know, without going into you know, anything confidential, um, you know, I agree with your assessment that it's not a question of if and when. And, you know, so, uh, you know, Oliver, in, in your world, you know, you, you understand, uh, you know, threat research and attacks and defenders, you know, probably better than, than most people. Um, you know, what, what does the federal government need to do next to, to be ahead on, on something like uh, GPS spoofing and, and, and other cyber attacks? I mean, G GPS spoofing is tough. I mean, I think I think the notion that that you know shipboard systems can be attacked is one thing. The 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 notion of the integrity of a signal that is considered that is outside the ship that is considered to be um, unimpeachable, becoming impeachable, it is a much tougher thing. And and an infrastructure like that has to ultimately it has to be kind of a a a national and a, and a global effort to shore it up in such a way that it, that, that spoofing can't in fact happen or that when the spoofing happens, that it can be clearly detected uh, and you can kind of be on a war footing. I think in general, when you, when you look inside of things like shipboard systems, as a, you know, these are embedded systems that are oftentimes running uh, pretty old versions of software that are, that, that were kind of assumed to be, safe from the internet and safe from, from cyber. And they were designed in a time and place um, that really wasn't as cognizant of that cyber threat. And yet they have oftentimes 15, 20, 30 year life cycles. Um, and obviously computer systems don't generally have that kind of life cycle. And, and so you run into these issues where it's li literally like, you know, a new world attack 
um, coming in touch with old world, you know, civilization. And, and generally that doesn't work out well for old world, world civilization. So I think in areas where we have those kinds of embedded systems, um, what in the commercial space would be called industrial control systems and other, other things like that, I think we need to be very, very cognizant of those threats. Um, and we need to effectively surround those relatively vulnerable systems with pretty good detection and defensive capabilities and try and really keep them um, segregated from the, the real world in which they can't actually survive terribly well at this stage. I think in terms of the next generation of systems that are being constructed on the other hand, I think there's a lot that is being done and a lot of kind of modern cybersecurity um, uh, you know, methodologies are, are kind of going into, into those things. Within the federal civilian government at, a lar at large, I think you're talking about, you know, a world that's much more akin to the commercial world. Um, these are kind of, you know, carpeted spaces, you know, office employees. Um, I think the efforts within the government to go, you know, to, to more heavily lean on service providers, such as using things like Office 365, rather than using kind of your own on-prem version of Exchange Service and other kinds of things. These are trends that we're seeing on the commercial side. We're seeing in the federal side as well. And I think what you will see over time is, you know, an, an effort to basically get these offerings standardized and to lean on providers that can effectively, that have deep knowledge within the particular applications that are being supplied and can secure them probably better than, than uh, each individual agency within the government and then have the government really focus on the things that, it, that are the systems that are unique to it. Um, and there you can then bring, as I said again, the flipping the game, you can bring your knowledge to bear because now it is effectively stuff that you are intimately familiar with and that you have a better shot at protecting. You know, one of the, um things that just doesn't get enough uh, enough uh, attention and I think funding is of course the human element uh, that was the title of this year's RSA uh, convention you know because you can have you know amazing AI uh, you know machine learning uh, you know great uh, defensive systems uh, you know big security stacks and if you have a human being who decides to you know click on a malicious link um, you know it, uh, there's exposure there you know so uh, you know, General Tuhill, what, what is, is your advice, you know, on how to uh, elevate um, the awareness and the importance and the uh, behaviors of, of the human element in, in the federal government amongst people who are not technology oriented, and now everyone or most people are working from home. So it even is going to get, you know, more of a sitting duck kind of thing from what I can tell. Yeah, Gary, I'm very concerned about the fact that a lot of, uh, as a matter of fact, I, I believe most of our uh, federal employees uh, deployed in place, you know, to their homes without getting appropriate or adequate uh, cybersecurity uh, awareness reminders and training about the uh, best practices for operating uh, from home, their home environments. Uh, but as you take a look at how the government, as well as many folks in the private sector, have been looking at cybersecurity training, it's usually an annual requirement, the one and done, and then just move on. And I think that's inadequate. I think uh, what I've seen through my academic research at Carnegie Mellon and my own personal experiences uh, in the military is continuous training and education is the most effective uh, means. And uh, making sure that you exercise that training is uh, it, crucial in your success. In the military, you, know, you get trained, you continually uh, evaluate and exercise those tasks, and you build a little bit of muscle memory. And in the case of a lot of cybersecurity best practices, the muscle is up here, uh, not up here. So we want to make sure that we are continuously exercising and training people on what those best practices are, and we are continually learning from there. Having a lessons learned process that feeds into that training and education is critically important. Uh, for uh, the audience out there, you know, we, within the uh, government and the private sector, we collaborate on such things like the CyberStorm uh, series of exercises that DHS runs the grid X exercise the Department of Energy runs. But you know, every organization out there can be running their own exercise program and bring in uh, folks who 
are specialists or experts in certain areas to help raise the game for everybody. You know, and uh, Christina, yeah, uh, you have to unmute. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I just, I just want to completely agree with the general uh, and also add that our organization, kind of all of my organizations that I run, run on the mission that it, it's, or run on the mission that it's about the mission. And so we're seeing even in the pandemic response, how important that practice is of preparing and practicing for these situations that could happen. Uh, but what really gets across to individuals is actual information about what they can do. Uh, whenever anything hits, everyone always asks, oh, what can I do? What should I be looking out for? Um, and as, as former president of InfraGuard of the National Capital Region, what we found is all our people wanted was actionable intelligence. And that's true for every single human being. If you hear that there's a honeypot going around, that if you click on the Victoria's Secret website, well, then everybody knows that kind of thing is happening. And that's the type of reminder, and it's not necessarily training, but it's the type of reminder that keeps that on the forefront of people's minds. So that when DHS gets an email offering free Redskins tickets, 60% of the employees don't click on it. Wow, did that happen? Yeah, yes, it did. even yeah. though the Redskins weren't a very good team. People still click to get tickets. You can't say that in D.C., General. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I was going to say, you know, and they're not even historically not that good. That That's incredibly bad. Uh, Oliver, you wanted to add to that? Yeah, yeah I mean, I think, I, I think trying to get, I mean, th there are parallels here to what we're seeing in the pandemic, right? Certainly, everybody has a role to play in terms of making sure that we reduce the incidence and the likelihood of initial infection vectors. The same is true in cyber, and that's really the broad communication. I think the other piece uh, that has parallels to that is the, the teams that are going to be at the, at the center, at the focus point, right? So if you think of hospitals and healthcare workers, they have a different set of practices, right? And for cybersecurity professionals, the same thing exists. There are things called red teams and blue teams. We run these virtual capture the flag contests where an organization can come in, and 15, 20 people out of an organization, we just stand up a cyber range for them in, inside the cloud and, and, and give them all the tooling and get them to actually use the offensive tools. So if you're a defensive person, getting to actually use the offensive tools gives you a little bit more perspective on what those things can do and what kinds of things to look for. So I think practices all around, both within the professional ranks that are supposed to be at the core of protecting us, as well as within the broader community that is intended to kind of slow down the rate at which things come at us. Both of those are kind of necessary. Wow, that's great. And uh, Dave, you know, uh, go ahead, Dave. I was just going to say the thing that's happening now, uh, and, you've, and everybody here has probably heard of it, is the uh, cybersecurity maturity model certification effort by the federal government to get contractors up to speed uh, at five different levels, depending on the size of the company. Uh, if, if you do not get this certification with, within the program that the DOD is doing now, you could lose your DOD contract. So it's got everybody's attention. And that effort is, is done, has been very well implemented. We've been doing webcasts with people like Katie Arrington, who, who works in DOD, and she's done a great job of getting the word out. And it's going to be continual because there's a process, there's a training or certification that has to happen, and it's a completely federal it will eventually go completely to every federal agency and they're all going to have to find solutions for it. Um, from, from no more password authentication to credentialing with biometrics, that type of thing. There's a lot of changes coming uh, on the federal sector from that perspective. And, you know, would, would, it, would it be safe to say that, um, you know, those uh, best practices and those standards could apply to everyone? Uh, you could make that assessment. I mean, they're, you, they're, they're borrowing some information from the industry, but the, the federal government has kind of a unique mission in the federal agency, especially DOD, and there's some challenges about that, so it's more customized to them at this point. And what about, just to stay on uh, CMMC for just, uh, yeah, General, go ahead. Yeah, you know, one thing on that, uh, you know, and I've been part of that conversation uh, for a long time, you know, what's uh, really coming out as a result of this effort is a reaffirmation of uh, NIST standards that are already out there. And, you know, this is just a reminder to industry, hey, we've got these national standards that apply to everybody. And if you want to do business with the Department of Defense, 
uh, depending on the sensitivity of the work that's being done, you have to maintain uh, compliance with these best practices. And for 90% or more of the companies that are going to do business with uh, Department of Defense, there's only 17 controls with CMMC uh, level one. These are things that people should have been doing already. Uh, and these are best practices. So they're already readily available for uh, companies out there. Um, as Dave was saying, these are some of the things that should already be uh, done in public as well as private sector. So I don't see this as uh, an, uh, a big lift for a lot of uh, companies. And for those folks who don't, aren't doing business with the Department of Defense, they ought to take a look at those controls that are on the CMMC website. And if you're not compliant right now, you ought to be looking at why. Well, that's a, a great uh, segue, uh, Christina, to you, because you know you have a very unique uh, insight into many different verticals. You know, uh, if people go to Homeland Security today, you know your your fantastic uh, online uh, website. Um, you see, you know, just all these different verticals. You know, ranging from, of course, the COVID response to cybersecurity, but also many other things like uh, you know defending borders and things like that. You know, what do you think is the priority for the federal government, you know, to do next? What is the next thing they should do either to enact these standards or, or to, secure, to secure the nation? Everything. <laughs> they need to do everything all at the same time. Um, and I say that jokingly and I say that seriously uh, because as we're, you know, we're working on the pandemic, uh, we're also forwarding every other mission happening in the federal government. Uh, so I think that it's, it's really a matter of not reinventing the wheel and using partnership and collaboration to spread what needs to be spread as quickly as possible. And I think the primary role really for, for the, the DHS and for the government is, is to provide that leadership to allow the private sector to work on these challenges with them, uh, and also to educate the public uh, and get out in front of some of these topics a little bit more. Um, that, last, that last point is really something that I've been encouraging for a long time because I think that we could leverage social media a lot better. Um, we've, we've learned how social media can be leveraged, perhaps by our commander in chief, uh, whether you agree with that leveraging or not, uh, but whether we like it or not, many influencers and others on social media have a lot of opinions that are not backed by any factual anything. And because the federal government is not out in front, kind of putting that alternative narrative into the public or the true narrative or the factual narrative, uh, people are stuck following hairdressers and makeup artists. And when they don't like something, they tell three and a half million people not to like something and they follow them. And that to me is a significant disadvantage. Uh, so, so I think communicating and getting in front of some of these issues and helping to ed educate the public why these things are important really does make a difference now that anyone has a platform. Well, that's a great insight. And, and just to now we're, uh, wrap up here, uh, thank you all so much for uh, what you do in real life and for spending uh, some time with our audience today. And, and uh, so we'll go around with uh, one more uh, kind of a question for, for you, Dave. Um, so, you know, much of what we talked about today um, is this balance between technology and the human factor and communication, you know, between the two. And, you know, you're an expert in, in communicating with the federal government and with others. You know, what, what's your big takeaway uh, regarding uh, how to most effectively communicate you know, all these complex matters um, using things like social media and, and others, you know, what do you recommend? Well, I agree with what Christina said, uh, uh, and in general too here also, but it, regarding the social media side, um, we're trying to get the word out factually from by, by taking te new technologies that are there. For instance, uh, at the AFCA, the Armed Forces Communication Electronic Association, which I know the general is associated with, uh, we have a, we, we're trying to get c companies to compete in like a shark tank. We've been doing it for three years now. And, the, and there's cybersecurity-based technology companies that come out with ideas. And then we have judges that go off and actually from the industry, cybersecurity sector. And it's very well attended because we do it live. And um, 
and you get presentations, five minutes for presenting from the company, five minutes of the judges questioning them, and we'll have four or five companies on stage. We we'll probably get another one coming up later part of May. Um, but getting that information out there about what the industry has to offer in the federal sector is, is important about in, in a social media format like internet streaming in this case. And we're, we're going to do this all virtually. We used to do it in the studio in person, but with COVID, we're back to doing virtually again. Uh, the, getting that information, I think, is critical in communicating and um, having people understand the technologies that are out there and these, these young companies that have got something to offer. That's, that's where I, I think a lot can happen. Oh, thanks for that. Oliver, what's your um, you know uh, big piece of advice for our audience on how to uh, stay safe while online at work and home uh, and school and and uh, what do you think the role of artificial intelligence and machine learning is, is going to be uh, for the future? Oh well, uh, <laughs> two big questions. Oh come uh, on! I, I think I, I think look. Uh, the, the, the general notion of educating, uh, of using social media, I think is important. I think it's it's super important. I mean, the realization of social media is you better make it fun, right? If it's basically just like a spoonful of medicine going down, um, you're going to have you know 100 followers on your channel, and you can produce the best content in the world, uh, the most meaningful content in the world, and they won't come and see it. So I would say, you know, education needs to be some, somewhat hip and cool and fun. And that's always kind of an interesting challenge. Um, I think people at home in general, um, you know, all, all the rules apply. Be skeptical, um, uh, particularly in a, in a moment of dislocation where you're working in an unfamiliar environment, where your IT staffs are interacting with you in an unfamiliar way. It's easy to get bamboozled into, oh, you know, let me just help you get your VPN set up. Just you know, give me, give me your credentials, log into this site, do whatever, right? So be, be skeptical. If you're in doubt, ask the, the, the powers that be, hey, is this legit or is it not legit? Um, on the AI ML side, I think the key thing to understand here is AI ML, I mean, we're not talking about generalized AI, you know, where, where you know, something goes in, I mean, uh, you, know, lot, you know, the most famous of which would be Skynet, which I, th I don't think we want to repeat. Um, so let, let, let's, let's, let's realize that AI at the stage that it is, it's, it's the thing that helps you, augments your reality, that labels things for you, that, te that shows you things that you wouldn't have been able to figure out yourself. But ultimately human judgment comes into play. And, and so knowing your environment, knowing things in your environment, that's the, that's the great win, is where an AI can do the heavy lifting and the slog and point things out to you and you knowing your environment can bring your judgment to bear. And so in general, I think we need to help our, help the people in our organizations to deal with that ambiguity, to recognize that security is never black and white, it's on a spectrum and, um, and encourage them um, to use their judgment, recognizing that at points that judgment will be incorrect and if we penalize them for that, we're basically teaching them that their judgment doesn't matter. So I think that that melding of human intelligence and artificial intelligence for the foreseeable future will be the great hope um, to take the mundane tasks, but then you know have the have the human ultimately be in the driver's seat. So to that end, Christina, you know, from your perspective, um, which do you think is the most effective in changing these behaviors and? creating a culture of cybersecurity, you know, would it be the carrot or the stick? It has to be kind of a combination because without consequences, you really don't get much changed behavior. Uh, if you look at, at changing behavior, it takes one consequence to, to actually alter someone's behavior. Uh, so you don't really want everyone to have their bank account hacked as a lesson, uh, but you do, as in the DHS example, that, that uh, email that was sent up with Redskins tickets was actually a spoof email done by the department. So it wasn't, it wasn't an outside malicious actor, but it was kind of a test to say, hey, did you pass or fail this? And I think it's those types of aha moments where you're shopping for shoes or you're buying your sports equipment and you realize that you've been fooled. Uh, and our adversaries really are becoming more and more creative. I mean, I am getting the most authentic looking emails to click on malicious links and you really have to have it on your mind all the time. So I think it's, it's that kind of training, but it's more just 
small reminders that, that give you an aha moment that says, hey, I'm vulnerable to this. I need to be on the lookout for this. Well, you know, speaking of being on the, on the lookout, uh, you know, General, uh, now, you know, you're uh, at the tip of the spear again, um, you know, with your work at, uh, at AppGate and, um, and uh, everything in the cloud. Um, you know, what is your view of, about, um, you know, everything migrating to the cloud now and, and uh, you know, uh, making sure your, your buckets are, you know, set up properly and all these vulnerabilities? Well, you know, frankly, as we take a look at uh, the landscape right now, your information is everywhere. It's in multiple clouds. It's on premises uh, in your, your office spaces. It's on mobile devices everywhere. Um, and, and it's co-located in data centers. And most organizations out there, if you go and you ask the CIO, uh, where, where's your information? Give me a list of where all your information stores are. They're going to say, I, I got to get back with you on that because your information's everywhere. So we've got to really change the, uh, the model for how we look at information uh, and understand information all the way to what I call disposable information. Our security architectures, our security models have to change. And the traditional perimeter, I contend, is dead. The perimeter now for cybersecurity is the individual. And uh, our security architectures need to change where we have a zero trust security strategy that is based on identity centric access to information. You should only see the information you're authorized to see and nothing else. And that does, uh, it doesn't matter where that information is. It could be in an AWS or an Azure, or an Office 365 or a Google environment, all the way down to the mobile devices that are out there. So we need to change our thinking. We need to harden our workforce. It doesn't matter if you are a cyber operator or just the guy working on the loading dock. We are all cyber operators now. So we have to harden the workforce, whether they're in the office, in the field or at home. Wow, that's awesome. Are there any last things that any of you wanted to make sure that we got to share during our time? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, for, for our uh, folks that are working from home, you are at your uh, greatest vulnerability to cyber operators right now. Bad actors that are trying to access, for example, into the federal government or into your business. Make sure that you understand that you still are a target and perhaps even more vulnerable to phishing watering holes and other attacks. Make sure that you have your home systems patched and configured because uh, a patched and configured device that is current is the, uh, the hard, most hardened system that we have out there next to you yourself. Make sure that you're using multi-factor authentication into your applications and know that there's a, a, a cyber environment out there that has a lot of folks putting out misinformation. So don't look just to one information source for your decisions. Go out there and check and uh, go to authoritative sources that are well proven and peer reviewed like cdc.gov uh, to get your COVID information. Stay engaged and make sure that you have multiple information sources before you make decisions. Wow, that's great. Anyone else uh, want anything you wanted to say? Um, from my perspective, I mean, the general's uh, statement about zero trust is, it, you know, I couldn't agree more strongly. The perimeter is the machine and the individual. Um, and, and you're seeing the exact echoes of this in the commercial space as well as the federal space. The notion that knowing about the, the identity of the individuals and knowing about the machines that they're using to try and access information is the critical, it, it's the distributed perimeter of the future. And so I, I would expect when we talk to all of our commercial customers, we hear them all heading in that direction as well. Okay, Dave, Christina. I, I'll jump in and just say um, to, to kind of uh, ride on the coattails of, of the general, uh, essentially that don't allow uh, yourself to become complacent because there are actors out there trying to figure out how to get into your systems every minute of the day and they are much hungrier and much more active 
uh, than, than you'd ever believe. So becoming complacent and thinking that you're safe is, is a huge mistake in this environment because it changes every minute. You know, and Dave? Did you want to I, add I, I was just going to say, I couldn't agree with Christina more. And we always know we're a target. We, 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 have, a, we have a TV channel called Cybersecurity TV. So every time we're live and on, I, I, our unsung hero and my company is our VP of technology, who's got to be consistently watching. And uh, it's, a, it's going to be a challenge, and you never can let up. Well, you know, with that, you know, thank you all so much for really being unsung heroes. Uh, you're precisely the kinds of people and organizations that we want to shine the light on to elevate. Uh, the idea is to create a networking platform so you know our guests uh, perhaps based on something you've learned about one another can find ways to uh, to collaborate for the greater good our audience can do the same thing um, we'll have uh, all of uh, uh, more information uh, about uh, how to connect with their organizations or them in our show notes uh, afterwards um, and if our guests could just stay on for a minute after we end the recording so i can get all the great uh, information that you want to uh, share with everyone. So, you know, with that, thank you on behalf of the uh, unsung heroes who toil in anonymity. If if you know someone who you'd like to shine the light on, uh, just send an email to Gary at cyberheroes with an S, uh, comics with an S uh, dot com. So uh, thank you. Stay safe. Stay home. Thank you.